Hey guys, welcome to Psychology of Spirituality. Just wanted to do the introduction for our next episode. Today I spoke with Simon Lau, who is a former U.S. military member. Um, he's also a doctoral student in clinical psychology. We spoke uh, about post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, its interaction with sleep disturbances. So before we get into the conversation, um, I wanted to do just a quick summary on sleep and how sleep affects us psychologically. So before we do that, let's just get right into that. The repair and restoration theory of sleep understands the different cycles of sleep such as REM to be vital in restoring mental functions. So our body increases uh, its rate of cell division and pr the protein synthesis to help recover uh, our vessels. So you can kind of look at sleep as being kind of a housekeeper throughout the night. Evolutionary psychology or theory seeks to understand sleep to be an adaptive function so throughout our course as hunter gatherers we needed sleep uh, during the night for a period of eight to ten hours as it was important in keeping us away from uh, natural predators and finally cognitive psychology or research understands sleep to be vital in helping us to process information so the brain being a source of information needs a rest period to help our long-term memory in the following day. So sleep serves uh, a little bit more of a restorative function as we mentioned previously. Sleep psychology seeks to understand the many different impacts and purposes of sleep on our well-being, um, on how we function on a day-to-day -day activity. And without further ado, Here's our conversation with Simon. Hey guys, welcome to another episode. I'm here sitting with Simon Lau, who I actually used to work with here at the Sleep and Emotion Center. I think Sleep that's and Anxiety called. Center. Sleep and Anxiety Center. Yes. It's been a while. <laughs> so Simon is a uh, doctoral student in clinical psychology. He's almost at the end. Um, so I always just like, if, if, if he can make it, I can make it too. <laughs> it's like, I, I look to him for aspiration and motivation. So I just wanted to do a quick interview with Simon where we talk about a bit on his uh, research interest, how he came to this field. He has a really interesting story. So Simon, right off the bat, how in the world did you come to this field of clinical psychology? What brought you here? Um, you can start off from that. Yeah, so I was never the academic type. I have a high school GED, good enough. Nice. <laughs> never graduated from high school. I joined the army uh, at a very young age. And in the army, I realized that a lot of people suffer from a lot of different traumatic events, mm. not just from deployments, not just from war, but in a lot of aspects that military life can cause cause and, yeah. yeah so during my time in the military i started realizing that i really enjoyed trying to help people talking to them trying mm -hmm. to trying to i want to say guide them in a better path just just informally informally okay. yeah with no training just i was an nco so these were younger soldiers uh -huh. and i just i saw them suffering i wanted to help, want to help okay. so after i left the military i started thinking about what do i want to do as a career I can't, you know, fight wars for the rest of my life. So instead, I decided, well, maybe I'll give school a shot. Mm -hmm. So does, does the military after you uh, does they, they give you some like options of after you get out mm -hmm. in terms of like, yeah, guiding they, you? Okay. They don't guide you. No, no. no okay. They okay. they do offer the GI Bill, which I took full advantage okay. of. Yeah, okay. and yeah, exactly. So I decided to get my undergrad degree in psychology. Mm -hmm. Got introduced to research and started volunteering at different research labs in social psychology. I think in, you were undergrad. Here. I was an undergrad at yeah, University of so Houston. Yeah, we were both undergrads mm -hmm. and yeah. graduate students here. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. We're Texans yeah. for life, man. Exactly. And, <laughs> Even though I'm from New York. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm from New York too. <laughs> so one thing led to another. I went from undergrad to research assistant to uh, being a project coordinator for a department of defense study to applying for a PhD program and mm. here we are yeah and my line of research now is trauma and sleep okay uh, very mm -hmm. interesting so would you mind delving a bit into that uh, in terms of research facets what exactly you guys research in the sleep and anxiety center? yes okay 
So my research interest differs a little bit from the other uh, graduate students in the lab. Okay. We are not a trauma lab and PTSD is not considered an anxiety disorder anymore. Mm. But when I joined it, it was. It was part of the anxiety disorder. Uh, and the DSM-4, DSM mm -hmm. the yeah. fifth one, they changed it. Yes, into okay. its own separate. It's a separate, uh, it's a separate yes. disorder now. Okay. But my mentor, Dr. Candace Alfano, has been very good at supporting me in my okay. line of research. Okay. and. It's pretty much looking at how PTSD affects a person, how sleep disturbances to include, include insomnia, trouble uh, falling asleep, trouble mm -hmm. staying asleep, uh, nightmares, and just overall bad sleep quality, and how that can have a bi-directional relationship towards uh, PTSD okay. itself. So recent lines of research have demonstrated, have begun to demonstrate that sleep disturbances preceding a traumatic event or sleep disturbances right after a traumatic event increases, increases the risk of developing PTSD wow. and also increases the risk of having more severe PTSD symptoms. Mm. So there's, if there are people watching this, um, what's some everyday applications from your research that they can apply into maybe trying to understand better the nature of PTSD or the nature of sleep, dis sleep disturbances? Is it, is it as easy as getting a full night's sleep? Is, <laughs> I'm not saying it's going to fix all of these problems. You, yeah. need, you need therapeutic help. Um, but I know, my, I know from my time working here that sleep cycles and the importance mm -hmm. of maintaining a good sleep habit is fundamental to a person's well-being and that's something that's often ignored and I know it was ignored for me as being an, being an undergrad you yeah. would think it's normal to stay up until 2 a.m. then have a test at 7 a.m. absolutely and then that habit just becomes normal and normal but mm -hmm. we know that from tons of research that that's that's yeah. going to have a, a, a direct effect into your mood into your cognitive capacity into how you how you even treat other people because it's mm -hmm. like man you're operating on a half battery pretty much yeah. so I would love to hear from you that uh, relationship between PTSD and and sleep mm -hmm. what what's some what's some signs that people can look for yeah so after a traumatic event your body is physi physiologically active you mm -hmm. can okay. feel intense amounts of anxiety fear a ton of different emotions. Okay. And a lot of these are contradictory to the sleep cycle. Okay. You know, sleep cycle, your body is naturally beginning to shut down, relax. Mm -hmm. Things are beginning to slow. Your uh, brain releases uh, melatonin and other hormones to yeah. help your body get ready to sleep. Yeah. After a traumatic event, biologically, your body has more of a difficult time doing that okay. because you are just more physically aroused. Okay. So getting a good night's sleep after a severe traumatic event can be very difficult yeah and just like the night before a big interview or a big test yeah, a lot right, of times people right. have very hard times going to bed they're imagine having that for a sustained period mm -hmm. okay exactly okay. so any kind of big thing anxiety inducing thing can disrupt your sleep yeah. cycle and when that happens like you said the next day you're feeling horrible you're feeling you know irritable all these different yeah. things now Think about that in the aspect of sustained long-term sleep disruptions. Mm. And the research is still novel. It's still ongoing because it was viewed as just a symptom of PTSD. Yeah, yeah. But now, now it's being looked at more about a comorbid condition versus just a symptom. So my best piece of advice for people who may have experienced something traumatic, who may be experiencing uh, severe sleep disturbances, is don't ignore it. Don't think... This would just go away, okay. you know. Uh, let me let me take some Nyquil. Let me you know pop a pill like Tylenol PM, and I'll I'll go to bed fine. Even though that may help uh, temporarily, mm -hmm. it's not treating the, yeah. the root uh, the root of it. Okay. In the short term, you may uh, get a get some sleep, but then the type of sleep you're getting may not be the healthy type of sleep. Okay. You can still have very disturbed sleep while you're sleeping, consistent nightmares. Um, just what we call REM, the rapid eye movement sleep, is very disturbed. Yeah. The sleep uh, cycles are just not normal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. In mm -hmm. most cases, does uh, do sleep problems manifest as a direct cause of PTSD? Is that pretty 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 well established in the in the literature? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, PTSD and sleep disturbances has 
been gone hand to hand since okay. the first time it was in the DSM okay. in DSM three. So it's it was considered one of the core symptoms, and amongst uh, veteran researchers or research on veterans, yeah. sleep disturbances, uh, specifically nightmares and insomnias, were the most commonly reported symptoms. And in a few studies, veterans actually would prefer to treat their sleep disturbances before they actually treated wow. their traumatic experiences. Wow. Yeah. So, so usually, trauma. Uh, when we're relating it to the PTSD context, most people are probably thinking of a war context, people mm -hmm. come from war, but we know that PTSD can manifest through a ver variety of different ways. Mm -hmm. So how would you quantify trauma? Um, trauma is any event that may have been life-threatening or extremely emotionally evoking that causes a severe emotional reaction and it doesn't even have have to happen firsthand okay. uh, trauma can be uh, you can have trauma from learning about someone close to you going mm -hmm. through a traumatic event mm -hmm. hearing about um, different aspects of a traumatic situation okay. so a lot of a lot of counselors a lot of um, people who work closely with victims of trauma can develop secondary and trauma oh. just from learning about these details even just watching a horrific event on the news like watching a tsunami uh typically it's more intimate relationships okay. with the okay. other person okay. uh yes watching something on the news about horrific details can invoke a lot of strong emotions yeah. but typically if uh no one you know is involved no one okay. close okay. um it doesn't develop that kind of deep PTSD. personal deep yeah. personalizes a little bit exactly but if it happened to your mom or a sibling your you know significant other then okay. it can have okay. severe consequences okay mm -hmm. what's what's the main core of symptoms that are usually associated with PTSD i know it's mm -hmm. intrusive thoughts mm -hmm. is a big one so mm -hmm. if you're having recurring nightmares specific to the event that happened or memories associated mm -hmm. with that event yeah it can be it can mm -hmm. be but it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily have to be uh no it doesn't no, okay. necessarily okay. yeah um most of the time it is okay but typically it's just a constant string of nightmares string, cause, yeah because mm -hmm. a lot of times people are suppressing those memories because mm -hmm. so it's like they may not even notice that the trauma is coming from some sort of event that happened because they're suppressing it and, but it still may be lingering and they just may be manifesting uh i think hyper reactivity is another core symptoms so mm -hmm. like like they're very aroused very, yeah, very hyper arousal hyper yeah. arousal mm -hmm. they're very aroused they're you're aroused very easily um so i think a really really important thing is if you are exposed to a traumatic situation even if it's something like i was talking to a friend and she works as a late night uh, gas station and there was a small event that happened where some a couple of people came in you know she's a small 85 pound girl and they like aggressively like stole some liquor mm -hmm. and she called the cops and there wasn't any violence or physical harm that was directed at her but she was very shook up in the situation and she was saying that her manager wasn't really taking she was saying she needed time off and she was you know like having trouble sleeping um, and she was saying a lot of people weren't taking it as seriously and then she ended up not taking it as seriously but what I told her is that even though other people may not be you know uh, they may not be supporting the viewpoint that you're seeing it's up to you to kind of understand that you've gone through a situation that's been traumatic and to understand to process it um, and, and, and seek help if it, if it gets to that point absolutely so yeah everybody has different reactions to what could be the same trauma a lot of times within the military you'll hear a lot of people say why are you so this or that i've been there i've done mm, that yeah. but everybody's response to trauma is different there may not be two people like that responds exactly the same way or has the same experiences yeah. how do you last thing i want to ask simon he's been very generous enough to grant us an inter interview um in the military context, um, have you seen a shift towards mental health services being um, introduced to the to the to the military population? I don't know if there's a better way to put that. I don't know if it's implemented, but I know research funding for psychological okay. health has okay. increased over the last decade or so, okay. looking at different aspects of mental health within the military population. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And has that 
been a recent recent shift you would say um i don't know what you consider recent over, over the past decade pretty much i guess because most people kind of like kind of look at the army as just kind of like you send your soldiers out there and then they're just like you know they're meant to do their jobs mm -hmm. and then they're meant to come back and then they're meant to take orders and they're meant to go back again so it's like kind of view them as like kind of machines in a sense but it's like no these are human beings who are going to come back they're going to have families you know so we would want our military to be you know treating these individuals in a in a very direct and and a primary way so not mm -hmm. waiting for them to come back when they've been in war for three years but really facilitating help in in the initial stages um so would you say would you say that i think the that, military is trying okay yeah. it's hard it's very difficult it's trying yeah. we we don't exactly know how to prevent PTSD. Okay. So okay. right now we treatment programs are reactive instead okay. of proactive. Mm. But research in resilience, research in coping has is being developed and hopefully in the future we'll see results. Have they uh Maybe you might not know this. Have they done any mindfulness stuff with the Yes. With the, okay. So there's um there's a research group near near Fort, Fort Hood okay. that does a lot of different types of trauma research. Mm. And I know part okay. of their research is with mindfulness, uh, meditation, yoga, and those in lines of those kind of... In the uh, context of soldiers, mm -hmm. in the context of the military? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. wow. I'm definitely going to check yeah. that out. That'll I think probably be the next they're called Strong Start Group. Yeah, they're called the Strong Start Strong Group. Start, strong Start Group. I can put that link in the description. Um, this is a great conversation. I hope you guys learned a bit about trauma and sleep. If you don't have trauma, I would still encourage <laughs> get good sleep, yes. fix those sleep habits. Yes. That's like the driving point uh, com coming out of this video. That's working in this lab really, really helped me like understand uh, just how, and it's like you spend one third of your life sleeping. So it's like people don't even kind of think about yeah. like, why it would be important, but it's like uh, common sense isn't so common sometimes. Yeah. So get a good, get a good sleep, seek help. I want to thank Simon uh, once again for being uh, part of today's episode. Don't forget to hit subscribe, support the channel, uh, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Simon.